Josh, welcome to the show. Mark, so happy to be here, man. It's an honor. Looking forward to this. Oh, the honor is all mine. Like we just talked about off air. Um, I'm, I've, I was a little bit like a kid in the candy store preparing for this interview just because I'm so passionate about today's topic that I, I didn't know where to start. It's like, we're <laughs> so much meat that we're going to get into. Hopefully uh, we're going to be unpacking your book, which I just recently learned about, but it's not necessarily new. It came out what 2020. Yeah. I launched it mid 2020. Yeah. Correct. Um, but you were so kind to send me a copy and I was kind of frankly surprised at how it's a, it's an easy read, but it's, um, it's larger than most books of this genre, I feel like. Yeah, you know, I was concerned, you know, from, from an author standpoint, you know, guys don't like to read a lot. We're typically not the demographic for buying lots of books. And, um, you know, they say, if you're going to write a book for men, you know, don't make it too big, short chapters, and, you know, and everybody's got their own style. But, you know, I was running this by a friend. I'm like, is this too big? You know, like I had other friends that are in marketing tell me like, hey, the book's a little bit, it's a little bit too much. And, you know, I was encouraged, like, how can you write a book called The Standard and have it be thin? How can you talk about Jesus as the standard for masculinity? Yeah. And I went with my gut. Yeah, I'm like, you know, this is what I got. This is what I'm releasing and I'm standing by it. So yeah, they're short chapters. And I hear from a lot of guys, they use it like a devotional. Um, so very readable, but yeah, definitely not on the light side. Well, and not to get too deep in the weeds here, but on that point, I mean, yes, it, there, in terms of number of pages, it's a little beefier than I was expecting, but to your uh, point, very readable, very digestible, lots of like really big pull quotes that take up space. So I think those, sure. those things contribute to the page count, but um, I don't want to discourage guys from uh, looking this thing up and diving in because it is, it's so good and we're going to get into it. But before we do that, I want to, um, for those who maybe don't know uh, who you are or are familiar with your work, tell us a little bit about who you are, your background and how you got to where you are today. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. And like I said, it's an honor to be here. So Hey guys, um, you know, I grew up in a Christian home, just, you know, was fortunate enough to, to be in a great family where, you know, my parents are together and just really had a godly upbringing. And, and I got really serious with the Lord towards high school, um, towards the end of high school. And I really started pursuing um, what he had for me in my life. And that led me into the, into the business arena, into the marketplace. I started my own business. Um, I used to sell fitness equipment. I started with one retail location. I grew that over the course of five years to three locations. So I have a business background. And then I decided I wanted to, uh, to change it up. And there was a couple of reasons why I was ready to move on from that business. I was newly married. And I made, an, I made a breakthrough into the corporate environment. And that took me into... Um, what became a Fortune 500 company. I think we might have been Fortune 100 at some point. And I learned the ropes there, um, getting polished, you know, going through a whole different training system. I like to say it's like getting trained in Egypt. You know, Joseph and Daniel had very similar experiences where they were sent into the world. And I got the best of what the world has to offer as far as the training, the promotion, um, the performance and learning the behaviors that I needed to learn and learning how to speak that language and show up in that marketplace and ultimately getting promoted over six times and still being with that company. So I'm a marketplace. I'm a business guy. And um, I'm also a passionate um, servant of the Lord. You know, I love Jesus. I, I love the message um, in the Bible for men. I have a heart for guys to rise up into who we are created and who we're called to be. And that's where, you know, every guy needs a, um, an outlet for their passion, for what they're called. So I would also say, even though I was called, Mark, and I believe that I'm where I'm supposed to be, and I was granted um, this promotional path, and I've learned a lot from it, and I've taken those skills, and I can use them in the kingdom as well. Um, we also are not defined by what we do. So I'm not right. defined yeah. by my title on my LinkedIn profile. I am defined by who the Lord says I am. Mm -hmm. And so we have to have an outlet to express and it's going to be different for everyone to express who we are and our God-given identity. And that started to man manifest itself when I really started to get serious about writing this book, releasing it, and then the platform and the doors that opened. And here I am sitting with you talking about something that um, I believe the Lord gave me. And you know, here we are, hopefully using it to motivate and inspire men to rise up into their God-given identity. Amen, man. Well, 
I mentioned before we hit record that we're going to go wherever the conversation takes us. I didn't plan on asking this question, but I'm curious as a man coming from the business world, having been a Christian throughout that time, did you, cause I, I feel like there are a lot of guys out there that feel like Christianity can't coexist in the business world. Like they just don't jive together, but uh, clearly that wasn't the case for you, but did you, what was your experience as a, a man of faith operating in the business world? How did that influence um, how you approached your day to day, how it influenced your decision making, leading people, all of that? Yeah. Um, well, I think it goes perfectly together. And for any guy that's listening, and I know you do too, but for any yeah. guy that's listening that thinks like, hey, man, I'm not a minister. Like, I don't live in church. I don't, you know, I'm not separated from the world. I'm in the world. I'm in the daily grind. Well, I'm in it too. And you know what? That's the way Jesus lived his life for the majority of his life. And even when he launches his ministry, he's not holding office hours in a building somewhere. And I'm not putting it, there's no diss on any modern day ministry. But the fact of the matter is, he went to the marketplace to gather his crew, right? He took blue collar sure. guys. And he also could have came into the, in, in, onto the scene in any class that the father decided for him. And he he chooses to come in as the working class, right? He didn't come in as a rabbi getting the best religious education. So there's so much there for everyone that's listening. Um, you know, seminaries, Bible schools, and colleges, they're great. Thank God for them. But we don't see them in the education of Jesus and his disciples and the early church. So there's nothing restricting anyone from walking in their calling and being activated in the marketplace. That's where we should be. We're supposed to be a light in the world. So I'll, I'll dial down a little bit more to your question. How does it manifest? Well, there's two ways that we can um, follow the call of God in our life. And it's really personal for what he's telling you. And I also think it's seasonal. Depends on what season of life you're in and what specific season the Lord has you um, in, in your personal ministry. And yes, every guy and every man, every person, every woman has a personal ministry within what I call your sphere of influence. So we're talking about the business realm. So my sphere of influence are the people that I touch within that realm. And what I was able to do, number one, is when we have a relationship with Jesus, everything should flow from that first. And, you know, we referenced right at the beginning of the show, Mark, you know, there, the Bible is full of marketplace leaders, businessmen, business people. Um, we just talked about briefly, I mentioned Joseph, I mentioned Daniel. These are two guys that are thrust right into the stage of the world, into a counterculture, and they don't compromise. So that's the first thing. And also, the Lord led them on various paths. It wasn't all great. It wasn't always upward, not for Joseph. He went down first, and then he went up. Same thing with Daniel. He's tested. Uh, but there is a promotional path where at their season, at the right time, they're in front of the king, they're in front of the people they're supposed to, and they're influencing the world. So we are in the world, but we're not of it. We're called to influence it, not be influenced by it. Let me just, without going through my whole career progression, I'll tell you how it shows up as a leader of people, because I've been privileged to, to be a manager, a director, and build teams, build high-performing teams, all the stuff that goes with that. And it really manifests itself in my life with servant leadership. And that just builds incredible trust where um, everyone may not know I'm a Christian, because sometimes you're covert, and sometimes you're over. It depends. Again, back to what season you're in. And... Um, you can be in an environment and you have to realize I may be here to win people over, but I don't have to go around being really overt about everything because Jesus draws people to himself. And, and as he's lifted up and as your character exemplifies it, as you walk things out um, in your life and activating your faith, people are going to ask questions. They may, real, they may ask why you're different. They may ask why you show up differently, why you speak differently. And that opens doors. And then on the flip side, there is a time to speak. There is a time to be over. Um, so I'm not all about only lifestyle witnessing. Obviously, that's the character part, um, but you, there is a time to speak. You know, it's our words that will really break through that the Lord will use um, to really bring someone to a decision when it's the right time for that. But ultimately, um, let, me, let me pause right here that servant leadership, genuine interest in people, truly caring about them, 
And when you're, there's a lot of leaders in the corporate world that are not good leaders. Correct. Um, right. You probably worked yeah. for one at one point in your life and it doesn't matter, corporate, non-corporate, blue collar, white collar. There's someone listening to this right now. You're probably like, I can't stand my boss or he or she is a horrible leader or not a good manager. And it's all about them. Right. So with us, we we're in the upside down kingdom. Everything's backwards. The first is last. The last is first. And so we show up as leaders serving the people we're called to lead. And that's one of the most distinguishing marks that sets us apart. This podcast is part of the Edify Podcast Network. Edify is a faith-inspiring app that brings together thousands of the best Christian podcasts in one place for your listening enjoyment. Cut through the noise and grow your faith by diving into the world's top Christian podcasts today. Download the Edify app for free from the App Store or Google Play or by going to edify.app. That's E-D-I-F-I dot app. Mm. Man, that was a far better answer than I was expecting to that question. That was phenomenal. Yeah, and just to uh, put a bow tie on that, um, as far as having to report to maybe somebody who's not great in leadership, so often we see people who rise to the top because they're good at what they do. That doesn't necessarily mean they're good at leading people. That is a whole separate uh, podcast sure. So what I feel like, but that is definitely Mark, a reality. Can we pause there for a minute? Because yeah. you're, you're, you're just like, I'm getting stirred up on this because. Oh yeah, um, go for it. We've, we've also worked for people that are not good. I have, right. I yeah. have, we all had someone in our life and, you know, we're talking about today's topic. We're talking about masculinity and Jesus and how he sets the standard for us. Well, part of that, and I'm talking to the audience right now is, <clears throat> everything's not always going to be great. We're going to be in different situations, um, different types of wilderness seasons, and God uses everything and he can use everyone. You know, I was, yeah. I was reading Daniel, you know, recently, I had to look this up, but for those of you who think the Lord won't use an unsaved person, possibly an evil person in your life, you're terribly mistaken because when the Lord is talking to Daniel, he says, he calls Nebuchadnezzar my servant. Now, Nebuchadnezzar at one point was possessed. He was eating out in the fields like a wild animal. So we're talking about someone that was possessed by evil at one point in his life, but the Lord still calls him my servant. So he uses people. He uses um, things that are unjust in our lives. So the question really for us is, who do we have to become in that season? What is he doing in me while I'm in a situation that's very uncomfortable? And will I graduate and will I pass this test? I just thought it was appropriate to share that since we, we talked about bad management because that, that's also a primary way for us in the workforce and us as guys where the Lord can work his character into us. Yeah, 100%. No, thanks for interjecting there because that's a great point. Um, I do want to dive into this book because I feel like we've got a lot to talk about. I held it up earlier for the viewers, but the name of the book is The Standard, Discovering Jesus as the Standard for Masculinity. And again, I am so passionate about this topic, the topic of Christ as our model of ma for masculinity, because I think that it's a concept that's been lost um, and needs to be um, rebooted, so to speak, in society today. The church, I'm using quotes, has become... Uh, and you even talk about this in your book, overly feminized over the years. And as a result, doesn't really appeal to many men out there. And, you know, combine that with the modern thinking that says a real man, again, quotes, air quotes, a real man is too tough to be vulnerable, too macho to be meek. And we have men everywhere missing out on the true nature of who Christ was as a man and the standard he set for masculinity. So again, this book is... Um, I'm still reading it. I say this to all my author guests. It's like, oh, I haven't read it all yet, but I am, I am reading it. You can see here by all the uh, sticky notes and the pages. Uh, it's so good. So I think your book, again, it's called The Standard. It's, it's not only valuable, but I think contains a message that every man needs to hear. So let's unpack this thing to a certain degree. We don't want to give it away. Sure. Um, you touched on your background already a little bit in terms of your career, um, but what everybody has sort of like a trigger to like, or that moment where you think I need to write a book. Like, mm -hmm. Did you have a moment like that? Or did, was this kind of always in the back of your mind? 
Um, it's a great question. I like to write. Um, however, when the the genesis for this book didn't come through the formal way you write a book, uh, buying a course or Googling how to write a book and put it together. I, I didn't do any of that stuff. It actually was just a devotional. You know, we, we shared a little bit about my background. So let me, let me give you the picture of how this started to come into being and what the Lord was revealing to me. Um, but we go through different seasons of our life. So here I am. Um, I've been in the corporate environment for, for years now. You know, now I'm in my 17th year at the time I was writing the book. I was coming up, you know, right around before 15 years and learning the best of what the world has to offer. And, you know, all the cutting edge stuff that's now, you know, in our corporate and business dialogue, personal development world, you know, EQ, our yep. emotional quotient. The way we establish trust, you know, if you're going to be coaching anyone, and I coached quite a few people um, when you're when you're leading sales teams, um, all of these things combine to to give me a new lens to read the Bible. So I was reading the Bible through this new lens that I had developed as a corporate guy, as a business professional. And I was going through the Gospels a couple of years ago, probably started around 2016 is when I started this book. So it wasn't a project that I sat down and said, I'm going to write the book. Let's finish it. Let's get it out there. It was nothing like that. It started out with a devotional. I was reading the Gospels and I was starting to see, I wasn't focusing this time on exactly what Jesus was saying. I was really focusing on the surround sound. What's, what's happening here? Like I was putting myself in the context of these stories. I was watching his methods. I was seeing the way he was speaking to people. Why did he say what he said? How did, you know, look at the question he asked. And I was seeing all the tools, all the attributes that the world is pursuing right now when it comes to leadership. That started emerging. I'm like, Jesus is not only the son of God, um, he's also the son of man. He came in humanity and he's, he's doing everything that we know is the right way to do things mm -hmm. before the world proved it, you know, like the self-development industry have stolen so much out of the Bible. You know, oh, yeah. it only proves the Bible is true. They just take Jesus out of it. They take God out of it. Yeah. So um, to land the plane on this one, I started, you know, writing a devotional, just what I was seeing. And I was like, just making my own notes. I'm like, wow, this is amazing. And at some point I was thinking to myself, I think I got something here. I'm going to turn this into, you know, maybe it's a little 30 day thing, or maybe it's something. And it started turning into a book. And then I just started getting more fired up about it. And there were seasons, Mark, I, I worked on it for a little bit. Then I put it down because it had to come as the Lord was showing it to me, as I was sure. seeing it and going deep with it. So it's over 50,000 words. It's not, it's not skimpy, like you said. So um, they were things that I really had to roll up my sleeves. I wasn't just skimming things to try and get a book out there. And then once I finished it, that's another story. I, I wasn't sure if I was supposed to release it right away or hold on to it. And we did my best to be obedient with that. Man, um, that's a testament to, I guess, your diligence to see this thing through, because I think, and I'm, I'm, putting myself in your shoes, it would be so easy to start something and have that much time go by and just kind of let it, you know, slide to the back burner and just let it go and never really finish it. But to, <clears throat> excuse me, to keep it kind of at the forefront of your mind and just keep chipping away and being patient, disciplined enough to wait for the Lord to speak to you and guide you through that process. That's, um, I think that makes the book even more special. Yeah. Thank you. You know, um, as kingdom men, our original call in the garden was to subdue and take dominion, you know, and we're still called, we're still marked. It's in our DNA where we want to take dominion. One of the ways you take dominion in life is by finishing what you start because everyone wants to write a book. Everyone wants to start something. Everybody wants to do something. You probably have a lot of open tabs on your computer right now. It's something's relegated to tomorrow, by the way, that's not a day of the week. Um, so you got to be specific with your goals. Um, but we all have a dream, but when you actually complete it, you take dominion in life. So doing this, it also brought some satisfaction just because you're taking dominion over yourself, which yeah. I think is the first place we need to learn how to take dominion. If we want to rule and reign and express what the Lord's put in our hands and exercise that authority in our sphere of influence, it starts with within us first. Sure. Yeah. Well, I feel like that's a kind of a good segue into the structure of the book, this thing is divided into six sections, each section touching on, I would say, key attributes of Christ's character and attributes that 
all men should strive for in our own lives, right? And yeah. so it's broken up into, uh, again, six pieces, six parts, self-mastery, leadership, communication, empathy, confrontation, and love. And I doubt we'll have time to touch on all of those, but you just mentioned um, taking dominion over yourself. That's self-mastery, right? Right, right. Um, let, let's unpack that a little bit. Discipline. I think yeah. guys don't like to admit it, myself included, but we struggle with the discipline, right? Whether it's how we spend our time, what we watch, what we put into our body, you go down the list, but Jesus displayed incredible discipline throughout his life, uh, right. especially at the end of his life, delaying his ministry until he was 30 years old, when in reality, he could have started it much, much sooner, right? Um, not performing incredible, spectacular miracles that would have had everybody on their knees, you know, worshiping him as who he actually was. Um, but that would have been counterintuitive to his, why he was here on earth, right? And then again, showed the ultimate discipline by allowing his own torture and death on the cross. So when I think of the role discipline plays in being a disciple of Christ, um, and as, as reading this book, it just kind of got me thinking in a unique way. And I guess that's the, the whole point of this thing about how much work I have left to do on myself. When you think about the fact that um, the word disciple comes from the word discipline. So how, again, how much more work do I have to, to do on myself to be a true disciple of Christ if I lack some discipline in areas of my life? Yeah, you know, we're all working on your thunder there. <laughs> yeah, no, it's all it's all good. Um, you know, when we talk about discipline, I love I love this topic. You know, in Proverbs, you know, it actually says before before Jocko wrote the book, discipline is the way of freedom. It says that in Proverbs, actually, a disciplined life will bring you into freedom. Yep. So again, another biblical principle that the world uncovers, and it's great. I'm glad they do. Uh, but here on this show, we're talking about where it originates from. So before we jump into discipline, there's two, there's two things we have to discuss first, because you, it, discipline's the wrong starting point. If mm. anyone's starting with discipline, um, I'm very cautious, I'm very nervous, because that can turn into legalism really quickly. Oh, and we have denominations, point. right? Yeah. We have entire denominations built on an outward form, and um, people that construct a perception, and they live a genuinely disciplined life, but if they're missing true devotion, then that discipline is just a form. So let's talk about the two ingredients that I see you have to have before you really jump into what is, what does discipline look like in the life of a kingdom man? This is so, so good for answering my next question. So keep going, man. This is good. Okay. Well, well, I'm glad. Thank you. Um, number one, in the kingdom and in this relationship with Jesus, and it is a relationship, it's not a religion, it's not a form. I know we yep. say that, but it really has to be living. It comes first, and it's born out of devotion. Mm. That drives everything. If I don't have devotion, and I only have discipline, guess what? I only have a denomination. Yeah, you have to have devotion. And that's what we see in the life of Jesus. So we, if we look at what he models, he's modeling in a constant unbroken fellowship with his father. This is why he's praying early. This is where the discipline comes from. This is why he went into a secluded place to pray or the, the disciples were looking for him. They couldn't find him. He was alone with his father. There's this intimate connection that is the foundation for everything in his life. And we better believe that's what he's modeling for us as well. So our starting point is always devotion. It's like uh, start with your why, right? Simon Sinek's yeah. start with yeah. your why. That's, that's sure. a good point. Yeah, we could definitely correlate it there. There's got to be a vision. There's got to be something that we're running after, after or discipline's going to just, it will break down. I mean, same thing. Let's just make this really practical. Um, a guy wants to get in shape. He wants to lose weight. He starts a diet. He starts training. It starts to get hard. He's getting sore. It's just like, well, he's tempted. You know, the food is in the house that he's not supposed to eat. If you don't have a vision for really what you're going for, yeah, we've all been there. I'm relating you don't have to a this. Vision, yeah. You're going to break down. You're going to be like, well, what am I doing this for? I'm not trying to be a bodybuilder. I'm not trying to be like, you know, it's okay. And then you start breaking down. So there's got to be, as you said, the why and in the kingdom, I'll call it devotion. And the next thing is, your decision always precedes your discipline. Mm -hmm. So we need devotion, but we need to decide. You know, I had a conversation with someone recently. We were talking about some actions they needed to institute and execute in their life. 
And they said, I don't know if I'm ready. I said, that's okay. Because you have to make a decision first. There's no sense in coaching and speaking and moving forward if you had not made a decision. Yeah. So you have to decide. And that was something Jesus issued to all men. You know, if, he, if he's talking to Simon Peter or whoever the disciple was, as he calls them to follow him, they have to decide, decide first. And then they're enrolling in his way of life, which is a disciplined lifestyle. And I, I heard something amazing, actually, just talking with a friend about this recently. So this is not my quote. Let's see if I can say it right. But we have to, to the same level we love, we have to have the same level of discipline. Mm. So we have that in our marriages, right, Mark? We have that in yeah. our relationships. You know, there is um, there is a sense of discipline with um, how we guard our relationships, what we do, and the diligence. And there's some days where we're, we're doing that. It is a disciplined practice. So um, it's the same way with our walk with the Lord. But the Lord calls all men into this new way of life. This is what we see in the disciples' journey. And there is an element of discipline with it. But it's not only discipline. So I don't want to present this, you know, grit, grind, and hustle attitude that the world has because they just say put in the work. And if you don't know the Lord and you're only putting in the work and you only have discipline, well, that's great. You can really build something with that. And you can go pretty far with that. But is it the direction that we are called to do and build as kingdom men? I would say we have to start with devotion first. Yeah. Well, let's sustain you through a lifetime. That's the question. Right. Yeah, because everyone will fizzle out eventually. Yeah, yeah. It's funny as you were telling, unpacking all of that, I was thinking of my own marriage, and you know, starting with um, you know actions first and feelings follow, and and having a devotion to drive your discipline. I was thinking of like a simple act of love in my house is folding towels, and one of the biggest arguments that my wife and I ever got into when we were first married was I didn't fold the towels correctly. And I didn't understand why it was such a big deal. Right. But then I was like, well, okay, I'm devoted to my wife. So I will mm. become disciplined in folding the towels the way she would like them to be folded. And now it's like, it's this act of love that I do, even though there's a million ways to fold a towel, I do it the way she that I know she wants it to be done. Because I'm devoted to her. And now I'm disciplined to do that. I don't know, I just, this is kind of a silly little example, but one way how that kind of manifests in real life. Yeah, yeah, it can express itself in a number of ways, but that's great because in that example, you're serving, you're serving your wife and, and what her desire is. And there's, there's compromise. And ultimately what it is, Mark, is it's less of you and it's more of Jesus taking territory within you to, to serve your wife and to show up that way. And you know, that's a small example, but he does that in all different areas of our life where we have to submit our will. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about the first section of the book, self-mastery. It's mm -hmm. discipline over my desires. And, you know, one of the marks and really what we're called to be, and if you need a vision for your life, if you're listening and you're like, I just don't have a vision right now, like, what is the vision? Like, how do I get that? What is that? Well, Part of that's going to come individually with your discovery with the Lord and spending time with him and seeing what he specifically has for you. But I can tell you something right now. We're all called to be sons and sons mature, sons grow, right? And this is, wow. this is the big um, driving force. It's part of the eternal purpose of why God created us, Ephesians 4.13, until we all come into the full measure, the measure of this fullness of the stature of Christ the statue of Christ where we stature, where we grow as mature men. That's the goal that we would continue to grow. And part of that growth journey is less of us and more of him. And what I mean by that is we're just submitted. We're mastering that part of us that, that seeks self-gratification. We no longer give in to the impulses, the hungers and the desires of our carnal man, our flesh, because we've now submitted that. And it's a daily walking that out. And it's driven by devotion, but it will express itself in discipline. You know, I love to work out. I love it. There's some days I go to the gym and I don't want to leave. Um, you know, pre-workouts kicking in. I can just keep going. And I, I love it. I, I love the feeling I get. And it's my outlet. And there's other days where I don't want to work out, but I still go. I do love it. I'm devoted to it. But there's some days I show up and I put in the work that day because it's a discipline that I've developed in my life. 
I didn't mean to cut you off there. Yeah. I'm, I'm agreeing with you hundred yeah. percent. I love the point that it's um, in terms of, um, I don't remember the phrase you, that you use, but giving up our, our carnal desires that that's, it is a truly a daily walk because we are by nature um, fallible human beings and we will default to sin whenever, you know, we're, we're, whenever and wherever we can, if we're not holding ourselves accountable to something higher. And so, yeah, the, the reminder that this is a, it's not a once and done, it's every single day you've got to strive for this. Yeah. And, you know, I want to comment on that because yes, there is a, there is a battle, right? We are not to be ignorant of our enemy. We have three enemies in this battle. Um, number one, we have a legitimate enemy who uses high level strategy against us, right? So there is a devil and he's after us and he wants to take us out any way he can. High level, then, but he's been using the same playbook for eternity. So it's like it's pretty absolutely. simple stuff. <laughs> yeah, but we he'll, he'll find your weakness and he'll go uh -huh. after it. And he's patient. He'll wear you yep. down and he'll wait yep. for the right opportunity. So um, we always have to be aware and not be ignorant of that. And then we also have the world. We live in the world and it's systems. And there's things that call out to us and there's ego and there's the pride of life and all those things that come at us all day long. Um, and then we have ourselves. So we have three enemies in this battle. And what I do want to say is even though when you become a Christian and you submit your life to the Lord, you are born into a battle. At the same time, we have secret keys for how we overcome the battle. And part of that is walking in the spirit and we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. So if someone's always struggling and always striving with like, oh, this is so hard. And I don't want anyone to hear us talking, Mark, and think like, wow, this seems super tough. You know, like, yeah, there's a discipline aspect to it, but we also have a secret weapon. The Holy Spirit lives within us. And yeah. the more time we spend with him, the more we master ourselves, yielding ourselves, surrendering, or surrendering ourselves, the more territory he takes within us and the more strength I have to overcome. So as we keep living this lifestyle, guess what? I'm not tempted with what I used to be tempted with. Yeah, I have to watch out for triggers. I have to watch out for certain things. If I'm run down or I'm tired, what could be a temptation? However, I'm living this life out of devotion. And it's the same way that you and I live as husbands, right? We're not cheating on our wives because we love our wives. It's not like, oh my gosh, this is so hard to love my wife. My wife. No, we've developed this and we love our wives and that's why we stay true. So very similar to our walk in the spirit. Well, and just to add to that too, God gives us tools to fight the battle, right? And then the deeper we dive into, into Christianity and understanding his word, the better we understand how to use these tools and how to apply them to our lives too. So yeah. it's, not, it's not an impossible battle that we're facing. No, no, we, we're made to be overcomers. We're made yeah. to be overcomers, but here's the thing. Not all men will overcome. And that's what I'm the most scared of. And I actually see the apostle Paul saying this in Corinthians when he's talking about there's rules to the game and I myself don't want to be disqualified. He's saying that he's not talking about losing your salvation. He's talking about, I can lose the prize. What is the prize? It's the crown reserved for the overcomer. So just because we're a Christian, just because we said a prayer, um, and even our living a holy lifestyle doesn't necessarily equate to becoming an overcomer and pressing in for the fullness of everything God has for us. Mm. That's good. Unpack overcomer a little bit. For those who maybe aren't familiar with that concept, what, what do you mean by that? Yeah. Um, okay. So this is really interesting because we, well, you know, let me start with, let's start with this. Um, the Apostle Paul was writing in the first century, and against the backdrop of the first century was the Roman games. And when you understand this, and I actually just recently did a deep dive into this, when you understand the history, because context really means a lot, because we're reading an Eastern book with a Western mind. And if we can see what was happening and we can pick up on why did he say it that way, what's he talking about here, um, we can get a clearer picture of the references he's making. And he's comparing, he's comparing our walk with the Lord and our upward call that's on our life to a race. And he uses the metaphor of an athlete and a soldier, but the predominant one is athlete. And he talks about we're in a race and he's referencing what the people of his day, like the Corinthians literally saw this right there. They would see 
um, the athletes preparing for the games, 10 months preparation before they could even put their foot in the arena. It's that when he talks about a disciplined lifestyle, they knew very well what he meant. When he says, I buffet my body or I discipline my body and make it my slave, he's not talking about some kind of ancient form of asceticism where he's whipping himself. He's talking about, I train. This is why we exercise towards godliness. And he says, because I want to obtain the prize. And so he's talking about, they do it for a perishable wreath. You know, they got a wreath, they got a garland they would wear. We do it for an imperishable crown. There's something reserved for us um, that those who persevere to the end, those who maximize everything they're called to go after in this life, that what God calls them to, and they press in for what he also calls in Philippians, he calls it the high calling. And at that point in his life, he's like, I haven't attained it yet. Later in his life, he does attain it. But at that point, he's like, but I'm pressing in and I'm running after this upward call. So there's, there's a desire, there's a calling, there's a pushing, there's a pressing that's happening in Paul's life that he's imparting to the readers to say, go after it. Discipline yourself, exercise. You know, when I box, I'm not shadow boxing. Like I'm looking to connect with the target. Hey, when we wrestle, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We're wrestling against principalities. I'm very aware I have an enemy. So it's pushing in for everything. And ultimately, Mark, I'll leave it here. Um, but in Revelation chapter three, when Jesus is speaking to the churches, he says, you know, stand firm and be careful that no one takes your crown. So again, I do not believe he's talking about them losing their salvation. These are the churches, they're Christians. He's saying it's possible to be saved and it's also possible to lose your inheritance. Mm -hmm. And we also see this within the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews has got a lot of athletic metaphors, the cloud of witnesses. Um, there's so much there that references the Colosseum and what Paul was seeing um, that we can connect the dots on. But ultimately, that book is about the children of Israel. And it's a warning for us as new covenant believers that we can be saved, we can be delivered, but we may not enter in to the promised land. And that's what we see in the Old Testament shadow of Israel. They, they encounter Passover, that's salvation, the blood's on the doorpost. Um, they escape Egypt, they leave the world, but the first generation never made it into the inheritance. That was a physical inheritance. For us, it's a spiritual inheritance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good stuff, man. Um, Another, and we're still just talking about leadership here. We're never going to get through this whole book, but um, on this call, anyway. Um, the another aspect of Christ is the fact that he was a teacher, right, and, and a coach. Mm -hmm. But so many men have this mentality of like, I can do it myself. I don't need to listen to anybody else. So I think it just underscores the importance for us as men, if we're striving to be more like Christ to be teachable, to be coachable by Christ. What do you say to guys who are just hard-headed and, and don't want to, they feel like that's a sign of weakness? Yeah, that would be insane to me because if you want to <laughs> grow in life, you have to be a student, right? Yeah, and, you, and you can be a learner and a teacher at the same time. So I, I teach, I'm also a learner because the day I stop learning is the day I stop growing. Right. Um, so we have to be humble. We have to be submitted. There's always someone better. There's someone better than me. There's someone I can learn from. And I've purposely sought out those people. You know, I have spiritual mentors and counselors. I have mentors in the business world. If, um, if I want to go into entrepreneurship, there's lots of coaches and there's, there's things you can do there. And I do some of that as well. So there's all these different resources for us. But I mean, show me someone who's not willing to humble themselves, submit themselves, um, and be led by someone and learn from someone. And I'll show you someone that's just, they're done growing in life. Right. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. 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 So it's growth. Some guys just don't see that. Um, they need to read your book. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's unpack communication a little bit. Cause I think this is a, another, it kind of overlaps with leadership in my mind, but it's, it's a key aspect of being a good leader. Christ was the ultimate communicator. Um, I think this is, a, again, it's a key skill as a leader. I see um, we can learn from Jesus when it comes to communication, I guess is the point. And I love the point that you made that Jesus always pulls people towards the truth. He doesn't push people towards the truth. And I feel that we need more of this in society, um, today in our political discourse, um, right. when it comes to politics and social issues, we've lost our ability to communicate in ways that pull people towards the truth. Instead, we try to ram it down people's throats. 
and we, you know, we dig in on our side of the issue uh, versus modeling it and, and attracting people towards what we believe versus yeah. spouting it through a megaphone. Yeah. So I don't know, just unpack that a little bit. Jesus was a storyteller and a communicator. Give us some insight into this. Well, you know, first of all, you brought up the political spectrum. So let's just talk about that for a moment because it's real and it's in our face yeah. every day. Yes. And, you know, I'm passionate about it. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're fathers. We want our, our families to grow up in, a, in an environment that's free where we don't get canceled and we have our right of expression. I'm not trying to cancel everyone else, but, you know, let us have our freedom as well. And let's stand up for our values and, and have a place for that. So the first thing is... Um, we have to be careful because there is two spirits or there is two sects that it also there's a spirit behind both of them. There's the political realm, there's a political spirit, and there's a religious realm, and there's a religious spirit. And Jesus deals with both of them, the Pharisees, and he also deals with Rome. And, you know, in the Pharisees, you have both. There, there's a governmental aspect, but also a religious aspect. And we have to be really, I'm very mindful, Mark, I, I could easily get pulled into politics. Trust me, I'm very passionate. I'm very up on everything. Um, it's an area of interest for me, but I also have to be careful on what I do in public, how I engage, because I don't feel called to go out of what I consider my lane to go into that, but it does pull me. I, it pulls me constantly. I want yeah. to jump in to the dialogue. I want to say something. But, you know, we have a lot of biblical references where, you know, David's one of them. He was called to fight. And there's one there's one experience where he's fighting for the wrong side. And he got he got out of his lane and he left what he was supposed to be doing. So I want to be careful about that. I just wanted to make that comment um, because I, I think it's a warning for all of us. We can have opinions. We can be passionate. We can vote and we can debate with the right people, but we have to be careful what we do in the public forum as well. So anyways, I, I'll leave that to people's personal conviction. Yeah. Okay. So I want to take this a little bit further. I want to jump okay. ahead to another point in the book. And that's the fact that Jesus came with the sword. Yeah. And I feel that I even get, I even struggle with this. Like um, you cited a scripture verse says, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Hmm. How does that apply to the political discourse in our country when so often political issues deal with moral issues Right. I'll just use the word, you know, abortion. Nobody likes to talk about sure. it. Sure. So how do we, how do we wrestle with that? How do we reconcile that point? Any thoughts on that? Yeah. I, this, struggle, I struggle with it too. Sure. And this, this merges really well into the communication thing. It's like, how do we engage the other side? How do we engage other Christians that have different viewpoints from us? Um, how do we engage, you know, our worldly colleagues and friends and family um, that don't share the same worldview? So, this is, what, this is what I'll say. First of all, um, the world is supposed to know us by our love. That doesn't mean we're pushovers, but there's got to be something within us that make us a peculiar people where they're like, they're just different. So we should be able to talk to anyone. Um, we're not trying to cancel people. I want to hear their viewpoint. I want to listen. And that's how you build trust. If we talk about coaching and even the, you know, what Jesus models and exemplifies, if you want to win someone over, Preaching or grabbing a bullhorn isn't the best way to do it, but having a cup of coffee and listening to their point of view and sharing yours and getting into a dialogue is a great way to do it. But ultimately, we should be known by our love. Now, that doesn't mean that we just roll over on things because Jesus was a man of confrontation. And I would actually say every time he brings a confrontation, um, he's doing it motivated by love. Yeah. love for the truth and love for others. Even when he flips the tables, when he fashions the whip, um, if we look at the context, it's actually clearing a path so the downtrodden could get into the temple. He was making things right and correcting injustice and bringing justice. It was righteous anger. Right, right. And, um, and express it, but it's motivated by love for people. It's motivated by love for the truth. So I think that's got to be our motivation, number one. So again, what's your starting point? Are you looking just to get into arguments? Are you looking to be right? Because that's not a great way to argue like, hey, I just want to prove I'm right. Um, in terms of the abortion issue, I'm very passionate about this as well. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, um, 
I want religious freedom for myself, for my family. We want to be able to express our views. I don't know if we can legislate. I don't believe we can legislate righteousness. Um, we live in, you know, the foundation to all civilized societies that prosper is the Judeo-Christian biblical worldview, which is what we have here. It's why we've been so successful as a nation. And abortions, abortion is different because it's not about your personal right. If you want to personally sin, that's fine. I, you know, the, one of the, the things that the Lord holds in the highest esteem is our free will. And I can't violate your free will and you can't violate mine. Um, so if that's your choice, that's fine. But when we talk about abortion, we're talking about violating the will of another, an unborn baby. And so that's where I draw the line is, well, we'll do everything we can, you know, legally to fight that fight, to persuade people, to raise awareness, to let them know that this is not just about you. You can do what you want, but now you're impacting the life of another. So good, man. Uh, yeah. And that's, that's a tough topic. Um, I'm looking over at my clock here. We're, we're pushing time and I want to make sure we have a chance to talk about another project of yours, the kingdom driven, the kingdom driven man challenge. Did I get that right? Yeah, that's right. The kingdom driven man challenge. Yes. There's a challenge I'm issuing to all men that are kingdom driven men. And that's just what I call a man who's looking to take dominion in life. Someone who's driven, someone who wants to expand and enlarge within their sphere of influence and also grow in their relationship with the Lord and go deeper, go deeper there. So um, I'll give you a really brief overview to why I did this. It's been something that's been on my heart for a very, very long time um, before I actually wrote the standard, because this is a way of life for me. So mm. what it is, and it's a follow-up to the standard. You don't have to read the standard to be a part of what I'm about to share with you, but a lot of guys do read it and say, hey, what's next? Or like, how do I do this? And people are studying it. There's some churches going over it. And um, I have a study guide that goes with the book. So I'll support anyone I can individually or group that want to go deeper into studying the life of Jesus and the standard he sets for men. The Kingdom Driven Man Challenge is a little bit different. It's not for everybody. And I'll say that because it may not appeal to everyone, and I, I don't know if it is for everyone. So what it is, it's based on a couple of premises. Number one, accessing your unfair advantage. And that's what I call our sacred space, our time with the Lord in the morning. Every high performer, Mark, I know you do, um, CEOs, athletes, they all have a specific morning routine for how they start their day. Jesus had one as well. It was that unbroken fellowship with his father that we talked about earlier, where, well, we need to have that too. However, the advice we're given and that we get as Christian men mostly is pray and read your Bible. It's solid advice. But how do I do that? <laughs> <laughs> right? It, it's like, okay, I've said it to people, hey, brother, you got to get in the word more, you got to just pray more. Okay. Um, but has anyone really showed us how to do that? You know, what's interesting, like, just go make more money, just go do yeah. it. <laughs> and you know, th this, I thought about this the other day, Mark, you know, the disciples, they lived with Jesus. They lived with him. They saw him, they had a front row seat to everything. Um, they saw the miraculous. Yeah. They saw the paralytic that they probably knew their whole life in that one spot all of a sudden get up. They saw the power of God. They saw powerful preaching. But when they go to Jesus, and I don't know if they've ever asked him the question of like, hey, teach us how to do that. Like, we want to move in power. And if they did, it's not captured. So it clearly wasn't that important to the writers of the gospel. Um, however, they do say, teach us how to pray. So my question is this, what did they observe in the life of Jesus? What is he modeling and what are they seeing that they're saying, I want to do that. Teach me how to do that because we know that is your source. So that's what the Kingdom Driven Man Challenge is about first. It's the foundation of connecting with the Lord. I call it the unfair advantage because we talked about Joseph and Daniel. The Lord has wisdom for us, understanding, and we have access to another realm, but we need to learn how to get into that place. So I have a very specific um, protocol that I take guys through of how to connect with the Lord in the morning. I send them a curated um, daily mission of what we're doing. And we don't need another devotional. I don't need another book on my shelf. I have a huge library and devotionals are great, but we actually need a little bit more how to, okay, now what? So it's not an intellectual reading program. It's a spiritual connection program. The next part that we need is to master daily discipline. It fits in really nicely with our discussion today. So for me, um, I believe all men are better 
when they're physically training and they have that outlet just because of the lives we live. Look at the century we're in right now. Um, unless you're, you know, a Navy SEAL or you're saving people for a living, you know, risking your life, you're probably going unchallenged in the physical realm. So I think that's important. And when we have that discipline in the gym, when we have that discipline in the physical realm of our life, it spills over into the spiritual realm as well. You can't contain it because the way you do anything is the way you do everything. And it will show up everywhere. And I know you like that quote because I've heard you say it. Yeah. And then lastly, um, upgrade your environment. How do you do that? Well, you have to be around other kingdom-driven men, men that are sharp, men that will challenge you because you will rise to the level of your environment. And if you're going on challenge and if you're trying to live, I call it living like a lone wolf, um, you can hide. And here's the thing. If you're going alone, lone wolves are strong. I'm not saying you're weak. You're probably really strong. But how much farther, faster, and further could you go if you were around the right tribe and you were in your natural habitat, which is with other brothers? Mm. That's a good point. That's a good angle on the lone wolf idea. I like that. Man. Josh, I could go another hour. This is so good. Uh, I feel like we did only scratch the surface, literally. Guys, um, well, first, Josh, tell everybody where they can follow you online, where they can get the book, where they can sign up for the next iteration of the Kingdom Driven Man Challenge, all that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So if anyone wants to connect with me on social media, you can find me on Facebook and Instagram at Kingdom Athlete. If you want to get the hub where you can get the book, I mean, you can look it up on Amazon. My name's hard to spell. So it might be easier just to go to standard59.com. That's standard, the number five, nine.com. And you'll get everything there, links to everything I'm doing. And um, you can get the book. You can read about what I'm up to. And then for those of you where you were intrigued with this Kingdom Driven Man Challenge, it's six weeks. It's a 40-day program. Um, and if you want to know more, you can visit kingdomdrivenman.com. And it's a very approachable price point, if I may say so myself. I think it's, uh, you, you get some skin in the game, but it's not going to set you back too far. So I, I encourage you guys to check it out. And guys, if you're wanting to develop your masculinity, read the Bible, get to know Christ, but read the standard, Discovering Jesus as the Standard for Masculinity. I highly recommend this book. I highly recommend you check out the Kingdom Driven Man Challenge. Josh, thank you so much for your time, man. This has been great. Mark, it's been an honor. Guys, thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's conversation, share it with a friend and subscribe to the show so you don't miss future episodes like the one you heard today. And be sure to check today's show notes for all the ways you can stay plugged into the Inspired Legacy, including my free download called Nine Ways to Be a Better Dad. You can sign up for my free weekly devotional called Inspired Inbox. And you can join the private Facebook group, a community of other like-minded men looking to become the best husbands and fathers they can be. So get plugged in. Like, subscribe, leave a review, and help more guys find the show because we need more men battling together for the sake of the next generation. Until next time, live inspired.